I get a call from the police, um, summoned to the police station. Um, and eventually the police uh, press charges against me and uh, against the two uh, hosts of the program, claiming that we were advertising so-called conversion practices by a bit simply because we we talked about my experience and I because I answered questions about conversion therapy. Hi guys, I'm Wayne Blakely from Noah's Love Ministries and I'm a guest on the LED set today as is Daniel. Uh, a couple of your regulars here are Mikey and Keith. And we have an amazing program for you today um, with Matthew Greck from Malta, who has been in the news lately um, all around the world. Um, Matthew uh, left the LGBT community. Uh, he's gonna share his testimony and then the sequel to this, the program um, that will come right behind this one, is uh, about what he's been dealing with in Malta today, just from sharing his testimony. And so Matthew, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I'm really grateful for you to, to be with us and to share your testimony today. Thank you for having me. It's a joy to be with you all. So Matthew, I'm looking forward to your testimony today. And I was wondering if you might start off by telling us about um, wh where you grew up, how you grew up and what things were like for you. Yeah, so when I was um, young, um, I was very musically inclined, I would say. Um, definitely not the stereotype and typical uh, boy, if I had to compare myself to other boys my age. Um, so, you know, I was kind, I was uh, sensitive to others, never wanted to harm anyone. I was raised uh, in, a, in a Catholic uh, environment, so um, I remember times where I would pray with my grandmother and she would have a written prayer uh, that involves the Holy Spirit, and I used to enjoy um, that time with my grandma and just that sense of devotion. Um, I remember times uh, when I was young, uh, being with my parents and my my older brother, who's three years older than me, and my sister, who was one year younger than me. Uh, we would be gathered together and and praying um, the, the the best way my parents knew to guide us to pray. However, I wouldn't say I I had a, a real or tangible experience of God um, in my childhood. Um, eventually. Um, yeah, I, I remember, uh, growing up, I, uh, you know, I, I, I started to feel a sense of pressure to perhaps conform a little bit to culture. My father loves football to this day. He always loved football and sports and so did my brother, but I wasn't really interested. Now, of course, when I look back, that doesn't, that never made me any less of a man, uh, but I just wanted to be understood. I wanted somebody to speak my language, but um, I couldn't really fit in with my brother and my uh, father that much. Uh, they tried to introduce me to football classes, but there was a resistance from my end, and it made me feel a bit embarrassed, actually, because it felt like I should do this, but I'm not able to, so it brings the sense of shame. So eventually, I think my mother noticed that I was finger tapping on tables and she thought that I might be a good pianist. So uh, my parents, uh, you know, introduced piano lessons for me and that was going very well. And uh, I think it was my little world where I could escape from all the stress of trying to perform and to be the the boy that I, that I was expected to be and just enjoy this creative world of music. Um, so eventually I remember that as a family, you know, we moved to France. I was, uh, nine years of age and everything was fine. You know, I was, um, I started to, you know, think about relationships and other girls and how I'm going to relate to school kids and et cetera, et cetera. But something happened when I was in France. Um, I was at home and I didn't realize that some television stations um, involved, um, you know, just lustful material. So I I stumbled upon a, a, a TV channel that 
uh, was just very lustful and erotic and it messed up with my brain. You know, I felt so violated and um, it kind of awakened me sexually before my time, I would say, and without my consent, really. I'm really sorry that happened because it opened a door to a lot of lust in my life and addiction. Um, just specifically referring to, um, you know, pornography. Um, so there I was and I, I, I started noticing that I could search for this material myself instead of just uh, stumbling upon it. And, you know, internet started to become more popular and so I started viewing this content um, in secret. You know, it was shameful for me and I knew that something was not right about it. Um, but eventually I noticed that I was inclined to looking for um, men and not for women. And that just made me feel more um, ashamed and, and lost. I hid it from my family. Of course, I was asking questions about myself, you know, what's wrong with me? Uh, this is not normal, uh, etc. And eventually, there comes a time where, as a family, we move back to Malta. And uh, now I'm in secondary school. And, um, you know, there's peer pressure in my teenage years to conform, to to date girls, you know. And I, I wanted to look normal. <laughs> and I wanted to be like other boys. So I, I started trying to date girls. And I managed to date a few popular girls that made me look, you know, like I could make it with my friends, etc. Um, but there was a lot of insecurity. Uh, at one point, I managed to be in a relationship with a girl for like uh, three months. I was 16 years of age, but I kind of wasn't feeling what I expected to feel with a girl. So I stopped that because I was thinking, if I don't perform well with this girl, and she tells her friends, and then my family finds out, or my brother or sister finds out, I mean, where would that leave me, you know? So I wanted to protect myself, I wanted to keep, stay safe, and I stopped that relationship. So I was asking, okay, some things are not working in my life. Who am I? How am I going to be happy? What does my future look like? Can I not be a normal man who gets married to a woman and has children? Why, why can't I achieve that, you know? And I just felt like such a victim of unwanted sexual desires. I didn't want these desires. It's just that I didn't know a way out. And okay. it was becoming popular on social media to declare your sexual um, desires or, you know, what you're inclined to. So at one point I saw this uh, popular dancer in Malta who claimed to be bisexual and this curiosity arose inside of me. Okay, let me message him. And I wanted to experiment to see how I felt with men. So I dated this man and, you know, and and it felt right for me and my body at the time as this teenager. And I thought, okay, so maybe this is who I am then. Maybe, maybe I like men and that makes me gay because society says that if you feel this way, then you're to be called gay and you should accept this and just go with it if you want to feel fulfilled and feel happy in your life. Um, so I dated a few other men, you know, and I didn't really manage to find a love that I was able to sustain and, and, and I didn't manage to find compatibility in Malta. Um, but then I moved to London. <laughs> to try and make it in my music career because I was I was becoming a popular singer in Malta as, a, as an R&B vocalist. I had a stage name at the time. It was called Jay Omaro. Um, and I was nominated for some Bay Music Awards uh, and Malta Music Awards as a best newcomer, best male artist. I was, I was uh, really going up the scale. But I moved to the UK because it was a dream of mine to to make it in the British territory and even more so in American territory. But anyway, I'm in London and London all of a sudden, imagine this island boy who moves country, goes to London, which is so gay friendly, 
And now it's like this big city life. Oh, yeah, I can be who I want. I can I can do what I want. My family will not fight out. Yay, you know? Mm-hmm. So, and, and then, you know, and this is in London, and it just felt like I could really avoid a lot of Maltese pressure in London City. And I start this relationship with, with, a, with a man, and it's more serious than any other relationship that I had in the past. Um, and he starts talking to me about Jesus because I was actually very interested in new age practices at the time. I wanted to become a Reiki master, practice the laying on of hands, um, for healing, but these are not Christian practices. I didn't know better at the time. It's just that I felt like it was very interesting to seek the higher power and to heal people with the power of your intention, it was very seductive for me. So I tried to attune myself to this key energy to try and impart it to others um, at the time. And and this man that I was in a relationship with had a bit more of a strong Christian upbringing, although he didn't reject homosexuality in his life. He was still a practicing homosexual. But I did see something different in him. I think this conviction that he had about the Word of God was something that spoke to me. Uh, my father hooks like like he connects me to this woman to help me to find accommodation in London, and he doesn't know that she's a Christian. And she asks me about my interests, and I tell her, "Oh, you know, I'm into New Age. I love the." The idea of trying to read people's mind and try to unlock your brain's potential and and energy and healing. And she said, Matthew, she said, be careful. Don't just let anyone lay hands on you like that. She said, because you don't know what spirit people carry, whether it's good or bad. I said, okay. She said, why don't you come to church um, with me sometime? And, you know, it would be lovely to see you. And at first I was a bit resistant, you know. Um, but because she was very kind to me and helpful, I wanted to respect her and I, I went along and I come into this space of prayer, spontaneous prayer that is spirit led. And, uh, I come into the space of just feeling welcomed and loved among these Christians in London. And I was very surprised. Um, to encounter something that is so genuine in a Christian environment. And um, and I was thinking, how beautiful are these prayers? How do they manage to pray like this? And they're not even reading prayers like I used to when I, I was young. They're just flowing like a river. And I, I wanted what they carried. So I was invited to go to the main service. And again, the worship is beautiful, and I'm seeing a drummer in church, a drummer. Um, and um, and it just felt so vibrant and alive. Um, and the pastor started having words of knowledge about people without knowing them personally. And at one point, um, he describes a migraine, and I literally had a migraine uh, that day. And I looked around to see if anybody raised their hand, because... People were being identified, you know, by the Holy Spirit. And nobody did. And my heart was racing. And I lifted my hand. And all of a sudden, he pointed his finger at me. And he said, Matthew, I sense that God wants to tell you that he really loves you. That really pierced my heart. And for the first time, I encountered the love of a heavenly father who knows me. And loves me. And I wasn't the same. I couldn't believe that I'm in the space. People are around me. And God would speak to me in front of everybody. And, and boast about his love for me. And that that was something I never experienced before. But I would say that when I look back. I guess I needed a lot of affirmation. I needed belonging. I needed to, 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 to be genuinely loved. Uh, unconditionally. So, uh, yeah, so that was a a transforming experience. And then, you know, I'm not, I I guess as an American, people have a lot of church experiences, but in Malta, we were very limited because the movement of the Holy Spirit only began stirring mostly in the 
late 70s, 80s in Malta. So we don't really have Christians who were who grew up as Christians in Malta. So for me, all of this stuff was really, really new. Um, and and um, and I'm invited to receive prayer, and I'm feeling what to receive prayer. How does this work, you know? And I move forward, and I don't know how to posture myself. I just, you know, close my eyes, and I was not used to receiving. You know, like how do you receive? You I mean I don't have to do anything? I just stand here and receive from you guys. But it felt like such an honor to um, to receive prayer. This was a beautiful act of love that ministered to me. I never received that when I was younger. Um, although I were, I was a worship leader in the Catholic Church, but um, there was never like a personal ministry that touched my heart in this way. Um, and I mean, this could have been any denomination. You know, I, I value what I received when I was young. Um, and we just go from glory to glory, don't we, in our lives? It's a journey. And um, yeah, so, and then all of a sudden, like this, this day passes and I'm filled with this intense hunger and desire to know God. I said, if God loves me, then I want to get to know him. And, mm -hmm. and I, I, I bought a Bible. I bought my first Bible and I, I was so desperate to know God. I, I thought that I could read the New Testament in a week and be perfect in a week, but I was like, I really wanted to just like make things right with God. You know, I had the, the Holy Spirit was stirring inside of me. You know, I keep going to church, you know, I, on and off, on and off. You know, sometimes I felt like, oh, I can't go to church because I'm not holy enough. I'm not worthy to be among the saints. You know, I had a lot of strange ideas at first. Um, mm -hmm. But homosexuality was never addressed from the pulpit. I managed to bring my boyfriend at the time with me to church and he experienced it and everything, but he didn't, he wasn't co like consistent. He didn't want to come again. And I was racing. I was running for Jesus. I was addicted to the presence of God. I realized that as I put on Hillsong, as I put on this worship music at home, this energy was filling the room. And remember, I wasn't too Reiki. I was very passionate about energy. I was a feeder. I wanted to feel the energy and the presence of God it is energy itself, isn't it? Like when you're fellowshipping with the Holy Spirit, you can feel him in the room. And so I was there and I was enjoying the sense of peace and joy as I stung to God. And I, and I was in, in this perfect balance and harmony. And I spent nights just worshiping. At, at one point, I only slept for two hours. All I wanted to do was to love on Jesus and to sing to him and to adore him. And I, I'm reading the Bible and I stumble upon verses about homosexuality in the New Testament. And okay, you know, First Corinthians, homosexual uh, homosexuals don't inherit the kingdom of God. And I'm like, what? I'm thinking, hmm. But is that talking about me? Because like for me, it feels pretty natural. I don't think it's it's talking about people like me. Maybe it's talking about straight men who mess around, yeah, that's bad because, you know, they're just, you know, they're just abusing. But me, like, it feels natural. I was trying to reason this out. I was trying to make sense of it all. Mm -hmm. But I had the fear of God, and I was thinking, God, you know, I was praying, Lord, I don't want to, like, try to find loopholes in your word. I want to mm -hmm. do what is right in your eyes, even if it costs me. All I want is to please you and to be at peace with him. Mm -hmm. And I studied the Greek words for homosexuality, and this understanding hit me that homosexuality as a word was describing a practice, an act. And this, I was introduced through the word of God to this idea that, you know, homosexuality is not an identity. Primarily, it's a practice. So if it's a practice, then you can stop that practice. And if you stop it, God doesn't see you as a homosexual anymore. Mm -hmm. So it's this idea that, yeah, Matthew, you might have not chosen your feelings, but guess what? You can make a choice around those yeah. feelings. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and this brought me so much hope because it felt like society taught me to, taught me that I don't have a choice actually around my, my feelings mm -hmm. if I want to be happy. But actually now 
I found happiness and joy in doing the will of God. And so therefore I could make a choice uh, to be happy and, and I could deny a homosexual act. When I understood that, I'm telling you, this spirit of heaviness and this weight left my body and my Amen. spirit. And it brought me hope. I said, wow, so I don't have to be a homosexual. I don't have to call myself gay. I never have to come out to my family, which is the very thing that I, I never wanted to do. It's a day that I never wanted to face in my life. And I was like, what? I mean, is this even possible? This is amazing. I can be the man that God called me to be and, and nothing else. And I was happy. I was happy. Like the word of God brought me so much hope to to be the man that I struggled to become. But actually now it was more possible than ever. I have a question for you. Um, yeah. I'm um, listening to you. Actually, several questions, but, but this one's probably most relevant at this point. When or did that realization start to apply to other areas of your life? Because I'm hearing you talk about it in the context of, of homosexuality, which for, uh, for some people that, that, that idea of, uh, they, they're like, okay, I can't, I can't relate to that because that, that's not me, it never was me. But did you, did you come to a point where you said, wow, God is the agent of change in my life for this. So that means God can be the agent of change for my life in these other areas of my life. Like, I don't have to be angry or frustrated. I don't have to be this way or that way. Like, God can just create me new in all of these areas. Did that, did that happen for you after that and, and how long? You're right. Uh, there was a time uh, where I was reading the Bible and I, I found a verse that says, you know, love the Lord your God in the Gospels. You know, it says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and strength and mind. And I, it was a, it was such a reality check for me. And I realized, you know, God wants all of me. And I spent 19 years of my life so far. And I don't feel like I've given him a fraction of what he's asking from me. And and I started weeping on my bed. My Bible was open. My boyfriend was next to me on my bed. And I'm in this complete different zone where I'm weeping uh, with this intense desire to, to give God everything. And I was just, it was the godly sorrow that led to repentance. repentance. Amen. And, um, and eventually then I, I realized that I could be baptized. I could... I, I could declare my faith in Jesus and, and give up my old man and become a, a new creation in Christ. Yes. So eventually, you know, I realized that I, I had more mastery over, um, you know, sexual urges in my life. I, I definitely had a peace that would guard me in turmoil, in, in difficult circumstances. Uh, and, you know, when people try to maybe manipulate me emotionally, I could hold my peace. Um, mm -hmm. There was more more joy that invaded my life. Um, I used to struggle with a lot of frustration. So people would speak to me and I would be very short-tempered because there was so much that was just clogged up, you know. So that there was chaos within me. But I I was able to be a bit, well, to be loving with people and not be snappy and frustrated all the time because... I don't know who I am anymore. You know, like finding security in God made me more uh, tangible and more inviting as a man, more inviting as a friend to people. Because who wants to be friends with somebody who's who's frustrated and snappy? You know. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, um, so much, so so much. Um, and I think it's also, you know, this this sense of performance. You know, maybe I was. I try to find approval from people through my gifts and my singing because I never thought that people would find me appealing for anything else, you know. But now, you know, manifesting and radiating Christ, you know, makes all of us uh, men who who are more desirable and likable and more approachable, you know, and and that made me feel more valuable. 
and that I didn't have to live my life based on performing all the time. And, and so I was able to be more vulnerable and more real and honest with other people and not trying to be someone who I'm not. And eventually I rejected my alter ego and my stage name and I thought, you know what? I think J. Omaro is, is buried in Christ, man. I think he's, Amen. he's yes. the old man who tried to be popular and cool, but actually um, the real man yes. he was, is just really not trying to be popular and cool. He's very chilled. He's, he wants to be kind and compassionate and associate with the lowly. That's what he wants to do, you know? So uh, yeah. I, I just rejected all of that um, as a, it was a process of course, but yeah, I think that's that's how I, I how I saw Jesus moving in all these different areas. Good question. Yeah, I'm I'm sitting here and thinking of the the Bible verse that says, you know, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. You know, old things are, are passed away. Behold, you know, all things have become new. Amen. It's exactly what your experience sounds like. So thank you. I'm curious about your age. Is is this happened when you were 19 years old? Um, yes, this journey for me started, uh, yeah, at the age of 19. You were already, you had a, a serious boyfriend and you became, you were getting a name for yourself in the music world and all those things. So I, I'm, I'm curious to hear more of your story because how does this relate to your boyfriend who actually intrigued you about Christianity, who seemed to have like less of an interest in church and things, but now you have an interest is this part of your story too? Continued from there. Yeah, that's a good good question. So, <clears throat> yes, eventually, you know, I'm convicted through the Word of God. You know, homosexuality is not for me. I must end this relationship because it does not give glory to God. So, mm -hmm. I decided to face my partner at the time, and I told him, you know. Uh, we got to end this. Um, this is not pleasing to God. And I really want to uh, pursue Jesus in my life. And I want to please him. And unfortunately, you know, this has, has to stop. We can't, we can't do this together anymore. Uh, it's not right before God. And initially there was this kind of emotional manipulation and, you know, hey, you're not the only one who's got plans with God. You know, there was a reaction. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but I was, I was very firm uh, in my decision. I, was, I felt like I was standing on very solid ground of the Word of God. Uh, you know, once you're convicted, you're convicted. Like, there's nothing that is going to stop you, right? Um, and so I had joy and I, I had comfort throughout this process. It wasn't necessarily easy to let everything go because we were, you know, sharing an apartment together and, and, you know, flat expenses in London are through the roof. So, you know, I, I had all the reasons, you know, not, not to do that almost, but I just had to put my trust in God to provide him. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, yeah, so eventually he chose to, you know, keep going with the homosexual lifestyle, unfortunately. And, um, and I, and then there came a time where we stopped living together and I was uh, fully able to move on uh, in my walk with the Lord. So, uh, yeah, it's it's unfortunate that, you know, well, this man is, is not yet walking with the Lord as the Lord would desire, but I believe a time is coming where the Lord will really arrest this heart and, and that he'll be a, a faithful disciple as well. So that's how things progressed with us. Yeah. So, so I'm in this space, you know, at, you know, as a 19, 20 year old now where, okay, I gave up homosexual acts. I gave up, uh, the homosexual relationship I was in now, what, you know, like mm -hmm. I don't see myself with a woman yeah. and, um, you know, I'm happy to be single all my life. That's how I was thinking. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I would comfort myself with, the. Uh, scriptures, uh, Paul's, with the fact that Paul was a single man who, who achieved so much for the gospel and the kingdom of God. And I was so inspired by his example. And I thought, you know, Jesus was single, Paul was single. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, these single men, you, you know, managed to do a lot in their lives. Maybe I can, I can be single as well, but actually 
I was, I was in a comfort zone, and I was using this these scriptures because I think, in reality, I didn't know how to get free from same sex desires, mm -hmm. or I wasn't fully introduced. I, I I didn't have support in this area, so yeah. I just thought that you know maybe I just now have to live a life of abstaining and. Uh, but mm -hmm. I, I don't think that's the full gospel. You know, the, yeah. the gospel mm -hmm. offers more hope than that. Yeah. But I just didn't have the right support. So I, I was stuck in this single for life mindset, you know, never will be able to be a husband and have children, but I'm happy to be single because I gave my life to Jesus anyway, you know. Um, but at one mm -hmm. point, it felt like I was asked, okay, Matthew, let's reason a little bit together. If homosexuality was legal in God's eyes and his law, would you still be true would would you still choose to be single or your life or would you choose to get married? You already know what the answer is. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And I thought uh, I think I would choose to get married. And so I I realized that there was conflict. I was like, so Am I in touch with myself? Do I know what I want? This is mm -hmm. complex for me. Does that mean that I actually desire marriage and I actually decide I, I'm, I'm, I'm attracted to marriage? It's just that I'm using the single celibacy concept as an excuse, or maybe I'm just stuck in that cell because I don't know how to get out. By this time, I moved back to Malta. Um, okay. Yeah. I think my, my time expired in London and it was time for me to come back to Malta and I, I joined a very healthy church in Malta as well. Um, and, you know, it's just filled with the power of God. And But I, I, I still, you know, the Bible doesn't necessarily give you a seven-step program of how to get free from same-sex <laughs> desires. No, no, no. Right. And which part of the team ministry in Malta was pretty much non-existent. And it felt like as a Christian, it was a bit sad, you know, because it's just not enough to hear from the pulpit. Homosexuality is a sin, I, you know, I, and thank you for that and act. <laughs> you gotta, yeah, and deal with it, and you have to repent. Okay, yeah, but good luck. <laughs> so you're, you know, I'm, I'm so, um, I'm jumping the gun. I'm, I'm. You come back. You're immersing yourself into a church congregation, and you have a history of same-sex behavior what did you were you open with that did you hide that how was the church in, were they receptive to you what was this like yes good question um so eventually i i realized that this church was full-on power of god uh really wanted to that it's apostolic and we want to impact the nation and we're bold and we're unashamed that we don't work. The pastors is very clear cut with the word of God and addresses homosexuality from the pulpit. It, it does not hold back from uh, being truthful and bold with the word of God and controversial topics like homosexuality as well. So I felt like it was a safe space to just be real and open because nobody's gonna be surprised, you know? Uh, <laughs> and I, I, I did share about it with my pastor and uh you know they were excited that somebody you know had left homosexual lifestyle and joined their church you know because it felt like a trophy for the church for some reason yeah. like yeah for homosexual you know uh -huh. so um eventually um yeah um there came a time where more former lgbt joined my church river of love in malta and the pastor was getting excited because he was seeing what the Lord was doing and how he was bringing these men and women out of LGBT into mm -hmm. God's kingdom. And mm -hmm. he had this idea, why don't we have a night, a special night at church, where it's fully dedicated to ex-LGBT testimonies from the church. Oh. Mm -hmm. and, uh, the <laughs> and we'll actually create a Facebook event for it and call it Gay no more changed by the love of Christ. Amen. Wow. Wow. It's bold. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he, and he created it. And we were going to have this night in church. And then for the first time, I think in Malta's recent history, 
the LGBT lobby protests in front of our church premises. And they're upset, you know, and we weren't even parading this stuff in the streets. It was at the church. It was in our own home. It was very intrusive. And, mm-hmm. um, but the news picked up on this and suddenly the forces of darkness in Malta were realizing that a remnant, a powerful remnant was being raised in Malta by God and that, you know, the, the the full gospel of Jesus Christ is being preached and there is a resistance to the LGBT agenda that God was stirring up and raising in Malta. Now, was that in this recent event or was this was this before this recent event that occurred? Um, so this is a, a, a few years back. I think it was around 2014. Okay. Before the yeah. laws came into place. Yeah. There's a YouTube uh, video about this called Picketing the Pastor in Malta. If you type Picketing the Pastor in Malta, it will come up. Okay. Yeah, there's some footage. And so I had a lot of opportunities after this to share my testimony on Malta's top television programs. So all of Malta, at, at first it was, well, it was not easy because I, I started to feel very uh, um, responsible to speak up about anything that LGBT lobby does to try to promote the normalization of homosexuality in Malta. Mm-hmm. Um, so I started to become a voice in this area and uh, somebody who seemed to comment about anything that is LGBT related from a godly perspective. And at first, you know, of course, it was a lot of hostility. Um, it's gay. What are you saying? That's not possible. People are born that way. You're ridiculous. A lot of hatred, a lot of hostility. Um, and Malta is a small island, so it's just it, like the word spreads out so quickly. And um, yeah, and but slowly, this idea was being introduced in culture that ex gay, you know, it started to become a reality because they started to see more voices come forward mm-hmm. and people were seeing that, hey, it's not just one now, it's another one and another one here and there. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's still controversial to this day, but I think it's be- people are becoming a bit more desensitized to it because most people think, well, if you're not harming anyone, we will accept you. Mm-hmm. So what uh-huh. LGBT tries to do is to convince people that our message and what we do and the way we live is harmful because that's the only way they can get the masses to turn against us. Yeah, because you're literally just sharing your story. I was this way and now I'm this way and you have people picketing you when you're doing it in in a private or I mean a public place, but yeah, it's an invitation. They somehow right? assume a dark cloud, yeah. <laughs> even though, you know, you may not be casting one. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you think about other forms of, of um, you know, I guess realms like take for example like uh, somebody who used to be a porn star right Mm. and they they say I'm that no longer you Mm. know I have reformed and and people are like yay you know it's so great and and no problem and and other things as well I used to be this I used to be that Mm -hmm. and no problem yes but Mm -hmm. for some reason this one's Uh a problem yeah yeah Yeah. because it's a lie people are deceived into believing that you are your feelings and that mm. is a distortion in and of itself um and when we come into a relationship with jesus christ he gives us a new identity yeah. and that identity is of the kingdom of light and this world is clouded by the and is being ruled by the kingdom of darkness mm. so we, we know that there is a battle between yes. those two yes. kingdoms and that's why we're advocating for freedom for people from who are being deceived into believing that this is all that they can ever be when that's not actually true. Yeah. Um, so it seems like Matthew that that God is in so you're what year are you in at at that point would you say like 2015 16? Yeah, because uh it was around uh 15 16 because then in 2015 um the the conversion therapy uh, legislation, uh, yeah. actually, and other laws were being introduced to promote transgenderism and uh, homosexuality and civil unions and gay marriage. Yeah. And it was just a series of laws and changes uh, by a, a progressive, so-called progressive 
uh, political force that took traditional a traditional party with traditional godly values somewhere that's completely different. It was like it's not a political party anymore. It's a movement that's going in a complete new different direction. Um, and so, yeah, we were seeing this massive shift happening in the nation. Um, and 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 then eventually, I had an opportunity to um, to participate in Malta's X Factor competition. Uh, are, you guys know about X Factor in America, right? Yes. Yeah. I, I thought, why don't I try, you know, like I wanted to challenge myself musically a little bit. I was feeling like I was not doing much musically and I thought, why don't I just do something crazy and different? And I, I participated and I had a, an audition and I was asked questions, personal questions. And I initially I said, I'm not going to talk about Jesus that early throughout the competition. I'm just going to give it some time and then mm -hmm. I'm going to be on this mission. And when I feel like it's the right time, I'll, I'll share. But uh -huh. God had a different plan. You know, I, 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 I shared so early and uh, I said, you know, that I left the homosexual lifestyle uh, to pursue oh. Jesus, that I now stand for uh, biblical marriage between one man and one woman. And, and initially, um, I had a meeting with the producer of X Factor Malta because there's, there was it felt like there was a battle around this interview before it went out. Uh, and one of the judges, actually, I had a favor. I had favor with the judge as well. He remembered me from when I was still J. Omaro. And now they're seeing this new okay. benefit. Gotcha. And, mm -hmm. and they always believed in me. And they were hoping that through X Factor, they could transform me and make me someone. Where is it right tomorrow? You know, yeah. But actually, I, I could not, like, I, I, I was... I could not follow their advice, you know, because I wanted to to stay true to Jesus. And Amen. and he said, Matthew, it's good, it's okay, but but tone this Jesus thing down because you will lose favor with people if you if you continue speaking about God all the time, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And anyway, and I have this um, meeting with the production team of X Factor about my pre audition interview, and the producer says, Matthew. We don't find anything wrong with what you said in your pre-audition interview. We listened to it. We're fine with it. You had every right to say what you said. You talked about your experience. We're going to air it. Wow. And uh, and if it was broadcasted, and then that was the whole story. Yeah, that's true. I want that to be yeah publicized. Exactly. And but when it came out, it was another storm. Um, and the producer found it so hard to moderate the hostility and the hatred and the comments. They had to turn off the comments. Um, and the Malta's Minister of Equality discussed my audition and my comments in Malta's, Malta's Parliament. Oh. oh. And, uh, sure. and politicians started talking about what I said. And please note, right after my audition, they showed an audition of a lesbian couple and in their interview, they were talking about how they got engaged to one another. And that was right after my audition. Yeah, of course, that was intentional. And yeah, and, and nobody said anything right. weird right. about that. But me saying that I don't want to be a homosexual anymore, that's not who I am. That was a controversy. It's like you could have said, hey, I, I used to be a very promiscuous person, but now I'm I'm going to be a Buddhist monk and celibate. And they'd be like, oh, that's amazing. Cool yeah. path. You know, it, it's almost like you can say you're going to be anything unless you're going to choose to be a Christian. And and all the while you're I'm sure it sounds like by who you are, you're not being disparaging to any other lifestyle or anything. You're not you're not demoting or demeaning or saying, you know, anything else. You're just saying, this is what I've chosen for myself. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, that's it. And so some people came to my defense because I don't want to be pessimistic uh, only. Like uh, the, the nephew of Malta's former prime minister uh, defended me. Um, Malta's ex-finance minister, um, uh, Antonio Fennec, uh, defended me. By the way, Malta, the nephew of Malta's former prime minister, his name is Ivan Grek Mintov. And um, my my church was supportive, of course. You know, I had to deal with my family, though, because, um, you know, I 
I, I, I missed to say this, but earlier on, a few years before, um, I decided to tell my uh, family that I used to struggle with homosexuality, but now I'm a Christian and I, 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 I don't want that in my life. Because before my first TV program, I was like, I don't want my parents to find this out through television. That would be so uh, dishonorable, you know. I have to say something, and it was it was not easy for me. But I I I I decided to speak to my mom first, and she was washing the dishes, and and I was just having this casual conversation. I said, you know, mom, um, you know, when I was a bit younger, I used to struggle with you know homosexual uh, thoughts and and actions, etc. But now I kind of left that behind because I'm following Jesus and she froze for a second and then she <laughs> turned around and said oh Matthew you know I kind of felt that about you and and then we continued chatting you know and I, I can't remember how my, how my dad found out I guess I guess my mom shared with him or something well, I, but you know she's going to communicate to her husband yeah that's the thing <laughs> I, I I didn't feel very like comfortable talking to my dad about it but I think she was the one to do that um, there was a time where my my father when I was younger faced me about pornography and he said Matthew I found like gay pornography material on the computer like are you watching this stuff you know and I denied it and I said oh no dad you know uh, some friends were sending me this oh, material dad. and you know and I was I was not a Christian at the time but I think it's important for me to say that I had this, you know, encounter with my dad and I, I lied to him and I denied I used to watch the stuff and I just blamed friends for it. Yeah. Um, but I think you can you can see that uh, my dad tried to reach out. That was very kind of him and I believe that he would have been accepting and understanding. But I, I just, I think that's the level of denial that I had towards homosexuality. That's how much I didn't want it. Like, even if, yeah. if my dad would accept me, I didn't want it. Amen. And I think, Amen. I think this is the first realization that I'm having. I never shared this on any interview before, but I'm realizing now, like if, if my dad was ready to welcome this in my life and to be understanding, I still lied. I didn't want it. Mm -hmm. Because I think, you know, God's, God's law is written on our heart. You know, we have the Holy Spirit to convict us of truth. And the more we resist that, the easier that thing becomes to do. When you sin once, you feel the guilt, the shame, the, the taboo-ness of it. But then the next time, it's a little bit easier. And then especially if you have a crowd of people saying, like, this is acceptable, embrace it. And then you start kind of going with the crowd mentality. But that does show that you had that sense of, uh, the Holy Spirit's sense of truth, you know, what is true. I also had thoughts about, you know, but my father is married to my mother. I don't want my father to see that kind of material. The fact that he did that because of me, I was, I felt ashamed. I was like, what if, you know, what, what could happen to my father's marriage? We never know. But I thought I would never want to, to kind of display or, or kind of show a sense of homosexuality before my father because I honor their, his marriage to my mother and I don't want anything to happen to their marriage. You know, like these are the things that people don't always think about. But no, it's deep. Ah, you know, like it, it, I just mm. never had the courage to, to, to be that man to do that. So um, I kind of jumped a bit backwards now. But um, yeah, so eventually I... I told my family and now they know and they're trying to discourage me. They're like, because they're very private people. They don't like these things to go public. They feel like a sense of disgrace. You know, oh, you're talking about this stuff and being so vulnerable and open on TV. What are you doing? Like, this is embarrassing to our family. Mm. This is how they thought. You know, mm. they had to face their colleagues at work. They had to face other family members. Oh, Matthew's coming out as a gay. What's he doing? It's so funny. You know, what is he saying? It doesn't make sense. This Jesus thing. And he's being so unpopular, like, and he's going against the tide. What a mess. But my pastor gave me good advice. He said, Matthew, you know, this is a spiritual battle. Do not, like, you have to resist the enemy's bluff and, and his pressure. You know, at one point, my, my sister claimed to be suicidal. Matthew, 
stop talking about this because I'm going to take out my life, you know. Wow. And and I had, I, I kind of answered respectfully in a way mm -hmm. that I showed understanding towards my sister. Hey, you know, I understand it's not easy for you, uh, but I have to do this uh, to be a witness for Jesus, etc. You know, and, mm -hmm. and I decided to stand my ground uh, and to realize that actually those words were infused by the demonic to try and prevent me from mm -hmm. speaking out. So Matthew, we have um, <clears throat> we have two interviews that we're doing with you, and so we're gonna we're gonna tighten up and close down on this first portion. But before we close out here, there was something that you said in another interview that was really. Uh, in my own experience, uh, I was relating to it. And you mentioned that when you came into the church and, you know, here you've left the LGBT world and yet you're, you're um, being mentored and you're uh, developing re relationships with men within the church and within the body of Christ today. And you stopped and you began to analyze that. Can, do you remember that, that portion of that interview that I'm referring to? And you said, I had to talk to God and say, help me not idolize men. Right, yeah. I think um, that's very true because I had experiences where I didn't fully understand how to guard my heart because um, for me, I had a lot of friends, uh, friendships with, with girls because I felt comfortable with girls because, you know, um, I didn't have to, you know, try to be someone who I'm not. I felt like I could just be myself with girls and related to relate to them a bit better. Uh, but I think relationships with boys were a bit more of a mystery to me. But to 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 be approached by brothers in Christ in church and to be loved and to and and for my friendship to be desired by them was something very new and refreshing for me. At times it would be like uh, surreal. And um, and and to to kind of form these friendships with men who never struggled with same sex attraction, who were my age, who were likable and desirable men, I thought, you know, how do I manage my my myself and my thoughts and my feelings? How should I receive this? You know, because I misread things about their expressions and I misread things about their actions and their kindness, and I'm in this reality, you know, and. And there's this uh, a hunger to attach to, to them, you know, that has to kind of go through the filter of God's word and his presence. And, and there were times where I was not very able to manage that well. This is where I think such clarity is needed to anyone that's watching or anyone we would talk to about having left the LGBT world they would say in us dealing with that, well, then you're still gay. Mm -hmm. And so they don't understand, or many people don't understand the elements of God calling us to deny ourselves for him, the difference between temptation and behavior. And so I think that makes it, you know, you know, very real um, as to what we're faced with today. I spent 40 years in LGBT culture. And so just because I gave my life to Christ didn't mean that same tra same sex attraction didn't go away. Jesus mm -hmm. is not a genie. I don't just say, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, take it away. Because yeah. many people say, you know, pray the gay away and that when you, it didn't go away. Well, sometimes what doesn't go away, it's like somebody who said, God, please take this desire for cigarettes away. And for some people it's gone. And for yeah. other people, they know that smoking is bad and that every time somebody lights a cigarette, they want a cigarette, yeah. but they go, aha, but God doesn't want me to have a cigarette. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to deny myself for him. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I'm, cu I'm curious about your experience um, in regards to this process. Would you say that you still struggle at times with an inclination to being attracted to the same sex? Do you consider, do you just renounce that at all? Do you not have any feelings or attractions towards other men at all? Like, I'm just so curious about where you are present day. Yes, very important question. Thank you. So, um, I realized that, you know, I, I, I talked about a, a time where I said, okay, then, you know, if the real Matthew finds marriage attractive, then I have to open 
my mind, I have to stretch my imagination and start to believe God for the for what looks impossible. He's the God who makes him uh, everything possible if we believe. So I said, then I have a faith issue here, and I need to apply faith yeah. to God's highest purpose for my life. And then I'm gonna take His perfect purpose, and I'm gonna mix it with faith from my end. Um, and I'm not gonna magnify the problem. I'm gonna magnify it exactly. now. Right? Yeah. Amen. Powerful. Exactly. And so that shift was very important because then mm. you know my I I had to start speaking in line with faith because. But Paul says in Romans, faith is in two places. It's not just in your heart. If it, it is really in your heart, it has to be on your tongue as well. Yes. And so I realized I need to change the way I talk about myself, you know. Mm -hmm. and, I, and when we speak faith, um, we are speaking the truth. That's something that I had to understand. God calls the things that are not as though they are. Mm -hmm. And so at first, I would get my carnal mind speak to me saying, you're such a hypocrite and a liar. You're saying that about yourself and it's not even realistic and it's not true. But actually, God is like, when you speak faith, you're speaking my language. You're speaking the truth. Mm -hmm. And so I don't, I, I, I'm not a liar when I speak faith, you know, because that's how, that's how we see the move of God in our lives. And so... Uh, you know, I'm being real and and honest here. Uh, nobody can claim to be free from temptation. So I kind of shifted it from seeing it as this fixed orientation to seeing it as a temptation, as an external temptation, instead of this like residing uh, oh, wow. disposition inside of me and in here and just you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so this this association was a very powerful thing in my life. And mm -hmm. I'm saying you know. And I, and God began to teach me as well that, you know, at the end of the day, we're spirit, we're soul, and we're body, and attraction works on three levels. Nobody, I was thinking, mm -hmm. actually, many so-called gay men do not know that they do have a sexual attraction to a woman. It's just that it, it might be a bit weak compared to mm -hmm. same-sex attraction, but nobody... Uh, what well, they 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 generally don't tend to ask themselves: Do I have a minor sexual attraction at least to a woman? Do I have a ten percent or twenty percent or whatever it is? You know, um, and I I genuinely believe that it is almost impossible for a man to be completely like unattracted, sexually unattracted to a woman. And I I, I do believe that there is a, a bit of a spectrum that is at work. And it depends on people's background, experience, uh, coping mechanism in life, etc. There are so many factors, yes. environmental yes. factors at work. But so I realized, actually, you know, am I spiritually attracted to a woman? Well, if I see Jesus in her, that's a spiritual attraction. I can already yes. see that I'm attracted to women. You know, if I see yes. Jesus in them, you know, they're attractive to me. You know, yes. it depends what we mean by attraction, right? So and then there's just all you know how they think, how how they carry themselves in their heart, their emotions, the kind of choices they make in life. You know, a woman who is making godly choices, who is compassionate and kind, you know, and walks in love. That's that's her soul, and I'm attracted to that. And so I think there are aspects of attraction that we don't talk about because. People are so stuck in just physical attraction. Yes. Yes. And just on that, if I say I am attracted to women, of course, you know, like, what do you mean that? How can you be a man who is completely unattracted to women? Women are are uh, are beautiful creatures of God, and you know, and they they have they can have a, a wonderful soul that's filled with the Spirit, and their spirit can be filled with God as well. So, hey, you know, mm -hmm. and then. Yeah. Of course, you know, then the physical comes, the physical aspect. And um, there's one thing I did. I said, you know, I can surround myself with failure stories. Oh, this Christian man I know, right? married a woman and this and this happened to him and it didn't work. So why should it work? Again, catastrophizing, like you were saying, making the issues bigger than they really need to be. And But we can still recognize that it happens, though. I don't mean to cut you off, but yeah, what you're saying, yeah, I resonate to a lot of parts of what you're sharing.
Mm-hmm. So good. And um, exactly. And and I said, well, you know what? I'm going to surround myself with good role models, with men yes. who left homosexuality, are now married to a woman. They have children. They've done. They've been together for years. They have a healthy marriage, a uh, good life. Uh, that that could in good consumed marriage, and I thought that those are the kind of men that I need to be surrounded with, you know. Yeah. And it's a choice. Like, what am I going to yeah. listen to? Am I going to listen to catastrophe? Am I going to listen to success to attract success in my life? Right. Um, right. Bad company corrupts good character, so I want good company. So, um, and and that's where I'm at, you know. Like, I'm open to God's plan for my life. Um, I I. I actively pray about this aspect of my life and I am I'm open to you know getting married to a woman that God has for me um but I'm not I'm not like obsessing with it I'm like actively serving yeah. God actively praying about it um and and definitely choosing not to be in a a, a comfort zone that God doesn't want me to be in um yeah. and so it's it's a blessing to to be in this place, um, and I know men who have different experiences who have gone through the, the same path, but having a different experience. Now, we don't have to always understand, you know, why did they make the same decision and have a different outcome? Um, you know, people are different; they they submit to God differently. They have different backgrounds, different weaknesses, different strengths. So how can we expect them to have the, sim- the same result? Exactly. Right. Yeah. right. Yeah. Matthew, um, <clears throat> you're active in your church now and you, you know, have a, an incredible testimony. And I'm going to throw out a teaser because we're going we're gonna to close this out here in the, the next, you know, 60 seconds. Um, what just happened to you a couple of months ago for sharing your testimony? Right. Um, and I don't want you to go into great detail. I only want a teaser here because we're going to do a whole nother program right behind this. Teaser it is. So basically, <laughs> I I did this interview on um, uh, a liberal platform, actually. It's not a conservative platform. It's a liberal platform that is uh, free speech. And... Um, I get a call from the police, um, summoned to the police station, um, and eventually the police uh, press charges against me and uh, against the two uh, hosts of the program, claiming that we were advertising so-called conversion practices by a bit, simply because we we talked about my experience and I because I answered questions about conversion therapy. Um, uh, as a term uh, during the program. So for more information on um, ex-gay ministries or, or looking into the possibility of leaving the LGBT culture and getting closer to Jesus Christ, uh, you can go to Know His Love. That's K-N-O-W, knowhislove.org. Um, also, I want to throw in here uh, on this program and on the following program as well, for Matthew to support you and for what's going on right now. If somebody wants to contribute to your efforts, would you lay out the email address of which they can send a donation? So it's MatthewGreck at live.com. All right, so, you know, I encourage anyone who um, has been listening to support um, Matthew. Uh, You'll want to look at the upcoming um, program that follows this as it relates to Matthew Gregg sharing his testimony and having been arrested simply for that, that it somehow falls under conversion therapy. So thank you everyone for joining us on this program today. Uh, We're outnumbered by our guests. Thank you to Matthew, thank you to Wayne, and thank you to Daniel. And we appreciate all of your input on this, helping us create this program. Uh, don't forget, uh, you can always visit us, visit us at littlelightstudios.tv. We're on YouTube. Uh, you know, don't forget to check out our t-shirts, uh, lightwear.shop. And you can donate on Patreon or on our website to help us make more programs like this in the future. Matthew, really appreciate your testimony. And you, we know from the book of Revelation how important our testimony is uh, when it comes to the Word of God. And so... Uh, Just know that if you're out there and maybe you're struggling with something in your life, it could be homosexual relationship. It could be something entirely different. Jesus Christ is there for you 
and he is the agent of change in your life and he can transform you and make you into something new, which is what all of us need because we're in a world of sin. So we hope that you will find that to be the case and we will see you next time on LED Live. Take care. There has been very few movies in the history of the world that have completely changed our world. And in 1999, a movie titled The Matrix hit the world stage. These stories are often told and seen over and over again. Is it simply just to make money? Or is there something more nefarious behind it?